Hi, welcome to the channel. For the last little while, I haven't been able to do any Bible studies because both Gail and I uh, came down with what later we found out was COVID. It started out with just a sore throat and um, a headache and sinus. And for the first week, it seemed that we had flu. But in the second week, the chronic fatigue set in and we also lost our taste and smell, although my taste and smell didn't go completely. But we were so weak that just the thought of getting out of bed was was painful. So through that week, we, we were really um, down and, and out and, and sick. What we did was we got an oximeter from Clix, and that measures the oxygen content of your blood. And so we did that constantly. And thankfully, thank the Lord, that um, our oxygen percentage was between 97 and 99, which is very good. Now, if your oxygen level drops much lower than that, lower than 94%, then you're in trouble and need to take very careful care of your lungs. But thankfully, that didn't happen to us. And then in the third week, we began to find our energy slowly returning. And we are not 100% yet, but a lot better. And we do thank the Lord for the many folk who've prayed for us and sent messages to us. And uh, thank the Lord for his hand upon us, keeping us through this. So let me then dive into this week's session and uh, drop down into my little corner. And let's have a look at the subject for this week. So this is part 17 in our series, The Gospel of the Kingdom. And the question that I'm asking in this session is this. Must I, as a follower of Jesus, keep the Ten Commandments? Now, depending on your background and the kind of teaching that you've been exposed to, you may well say, no, 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 I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. Um, and really, what Jesus was doing in bringing the gospel of the kingdom, he was speaking to the Jews, whereas Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And so I follow Paul's gospel. So there seems then in the understanding of some that there is a difference between the gospel that Jesus brought and the gospel that Paul brought. Now I'm hoping in this session to show you that that's not correct, that both Paul, Jesus, um, Philip, all the apostles, in fact, gave the same gospel. There is only one gospel. It is the gospel of the kingdom. So we need to then just look a little deeper into this, see what Paul has to say about the law and about grace, and then see what the Lord Jesus has to say. So I'm taking this from the Sermon on the Mount and the most um, detailed and exhaustive presentation of the Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Although the Lord Jesus gave this teaching in all the villages and cities, wherever he went, he continually uh, presented the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom. So let's then look at what Jesus has to say in Matthew chapter 5 about the law. So rather surprisingly, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. All the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then he says, Truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now these are the words of Jesus, the very Son of God, the very King of the Kingdom, and the expectation throughout the Bible for the last 4,000 years prior to the coming of Jesus was that Messiah would come and he would tell us about the kingdom. He would be the king and he would set things in order. So here is Jesus um, after this 4,000 year expectation of his arrival coming and telling us this. He says the law will remain until everything is accomplished. Jesus then gives quite a severe warning to those who teach the scriptures. He says, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices, notice that, 
practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He then says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So the law of God is particularly important and Jesus is putting a great emphasis upon this. Now it's important at this point to make a distinction between the Ten Commandments and the other laws. So the Ten Commandments were written by God on tablets of stone. But then throughout the uh, Torah, in other words from Genesis through to Deuteronomy, the books of Moses, there were 603 distinctive laws. These laws really were to identify the Jews as unique from the other nations so that they could be a light to the non-Jewish nations. So these 603 laws were laws of diet, laws of social interaction, laws of health, hygiene, etc. All of those laws were to distinguish the nation of Israel from all the other nations around about them. So we're not talking about the 603 laws, but the Ten Commandments. Now, to also important to note is that the Ten Commandments and not the 603 laws were kept in the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle in the wilderness and then were transferred into the temple when once Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. So these Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone are very, very important, the moral law of God. So that's really what we're talking about here. Now I've chosen this picture of an Amish family just to show how that their dress code and lifestyle make them stand out from everybody else. Everyone around the world knows Amish people the moment they see them. So those 603 laws did the same thing for Israel. They made them stand out among the nations and they looked very different. Um, so I'm not talking then about the 603 laws, as I said earlier, but rather the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments. Should we keep that or should we not? Now Jesus said not one of those things will be removed until everything is accomplished. So that's important. Now, as a suggestion, it might be good to pause the video at this point and see if you can quote all Ten Commandments from memory without looking at Exodus chapter 20. Turning then to what Paul has to say, and here is another distinctive of the Jewish nation. They had the covenant of circumcision. All the males had to be physically circumcised. So Paul deals with this and he says in Romans chapter 2, he says, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, if you're a Jew and you keep the whole law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So even though you might be circumcised and consider yourself a Jew because you're circumcised, he says that distinctive does not help you if you don't keep the law. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, the moral standard, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? So now he's arguing the fact that even if one does not have the distinctive of a physical circumcision, but you're able to walk in the way of the law, you, you, you keep the moral standard of the, of the law, then he says, your uncircumcision is actually like circumcision. He then goes on to say, And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, who even with your written code of circumcision, in the covenant, in the, in the Old Testament scriptures, are a transgressor of the law. So even though you've got physical circumcision and you've got the, the written covenant and the command of God to be circumcised in your favor, but if you don't keep the moral standard of, the, of God's law, then your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Now, this is where... Paul tells us about the weakness of the law, even the Ten Commandments. He says, All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, 
Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Elsewhere, Paul says that we have all sinned, we've all transgressed, we've all broken the law. That means that the curse is upon us because, as he has said, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Then he says, clearly, no one is justified before God by the law. So the law can't save us. Even if we try to do it, the law can't save us. The righteous will live by faith. Now he is really referring back to the covenant God made with Abraham. And Abraham believed God. So he's saying that we should just believe God. That's how we get saved. That's how we get forgiven and rescued from our sin. The law can't do that. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a pole or upon a cross, a tree. So Jesus took that curse upon himself. He paid the full price to set us free from the condemnation of having broken the law. That is immense. That is wonderful. That is salvation. And that's where we may get the impression that having been set free, we now should not be concern ourselves with the Ten Commandments and with the moral standard of God. And that's what I'm arguing to say. No, we can't. The law can't save us. But having got saved, we now need to live according to the moral standard of God, according to the Ten Commandments. So Paul goes on and he says, For when Gentiles non-Jews, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts. So he's now referring to the new covenant, where God says, I will make a new covenant with my people, and I will write my laws upon their hearts and upon their minds by the Holy Spirit. So he's referring to that, and he's saying, their conscience also bearing witness. So this is an inner understanding of the law. And and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when God will judge the secret of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So he, his gospel is exactly the same as the Lord Jesus. He is saying that the law is written upon our hearts. And even though we're not Jews, by faith, we've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Our sins have been forgiven, but the law is written upon our hearts and our conscience has been exercised to understand what is good and evil in the sight of God by virtue of the Ten Commandments. And so we're living like that, even though we're not circumcised and even though we're not living by the distinctive 603 laws, but we're abiding by the moral standard of God. Now, just to illustrate the fact that Paul supports the Ten Commandments very strongly. Let's continue and just see what he has to say in the book of Romans. So here Paul is making reference in Romans to various commandments. And, and clearly he is supporting the fact that we should live by these. But he explains something very important. He says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, they're all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, where did he get that from? Remember, Jesus said, the very foundation of the law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. So obviously he's quoting from that. So the very foundation of the law is to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now he is saying that if this is written in our hearts, if we have been set free from the curse of the law, and the condemnation of the law, and God has written the law upon our hearts, and the Spirit of God has put the love of God within us, then we will from our very hearts abide by the law and the, and the moral standard that God has set. 
so that it will be a heart motivation because we love the Lord and we love our neighbor as ourselves. Then Paul also quotes another of the Ten Commandments when he says in Ephesians, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, why is it right? Because it's written in the Ten Commandments. Then he quotes, he says, Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. So quite clearly, Paul is endorsing the fact that we should live with the Ten Commandments written upon our hearts. And this should become our very lifestyle as we love the Lord our God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength. Now, there is one commandment that we might find controversial and difficult, and that is the one where the scripture says, and we shall we should keep the Sabbath day holy and in it do no work whatsoever. Now, because there is such a profound depth of truth in that commandment, I want to leave that over to the next video and I'll deal with that in some depth because that's a, a very, very wonderful one and a precious one. And it's one that has been uh, hijacked and misapplied in legalism in many quarters. So let's understand that particular command um, and ask the Lord to direct our thoughts and our understanding into a deeper appreciation of what the Sabbath is all about. Having said all that we've said and looked at, I'm now going to change the question that I asked in the very beginning just to add impact to what we are dealing with and the importance of this subject. This is the question, will we inherit the kingdom of God if we, as followers of Jesus, continue in a lifestyle of breaking the Ten Commandments? Now, I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to allow the Lord Jesus to answer it. In the same Sermon on the Mount, right at the end, in chapter 7, he says, But everyone who hears these sayings of mine, now remember, he said, I've not come to put the Ten Commandments, the law aside, I've come to fulfill them, and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So he's saying if we do not abide by the things that he's teaching us, we will find our whole lives collapsing at the end. Uh, so this is a very, very severe and important warning. So let's see now what Paul has to say. He says, do you not know, and he's writing to the Corinthian believers, that the, uh, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. So let's not be deceived by... Grace covers everything and it doesn't really matter how I live. God has saved me. He loves me. Unconditional love. Let's not be deceived by those things. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. John also tells us, right at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, when he's talking about the new Jerusalem and the new creation, he says that God will wipe away all tears, etc. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murders, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So very clearly from Jesus, from Paul, from John, Having come to know the Lord Jesus, we are required to live to the standard that God has set. So while those are very challenging words and rather scary, let's take heart by this wonderful invitation that we should, it says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy where we've stumbled, where we've failed, where we've made bad choices, mercy and forgiveness is available for us, and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is the wonderful thing about the new covenant. There is grace available from God. There is access to the very throne of God. We can come before him, and he will strengthen us and enable us to keep 
his moral standard and to live the way he wants us to. Now, the distinctive of Christians is what what, uh, Paul says in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. This is our distinctive. So it's not our clothing or our hygiene or our manner of life in, in the sense of the 603 laws. We don't live like the Amish people. But the fruit of the Spirit that is seen in our character and in our lifestyle, in, in our motivation, the way we deal with people, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And Paul says, against that kind of spirit, there is no law. So no law is required when the motivation of your heart is to live like this because then you're loving the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. And as Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Obviously not. So our fruit, our character, our lifestyle, our manner of living, because it's all written upon our hearts, will be the keeping of God's moral standard, but in this way, in a loving way, the love of God shining from us. Now, unfortunately, as one looks at Christianity in general, we see quite the opposite. But may God give us the grace that our distinctive in this world is that we love one another. As Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, my followers, by your love one for another. Amen.